Tonight, I'm thrilled to welcome my friend Janine Basinger to the Free Library. A true pioneer in her field, Janine is one of the most influential and iconic figures in the film world today. She founded Wesleyan University's revered film studies department in 1969, where she is Corwin Fuller Professor of Film Studies and also established its Ogden and Mary Louise Reed Cinema Archives, one of the most important repositories of film history in existence. I first met Janine over 40 years ago when, as a junior at Wesleyan, I meekly entered her classroom for her course in the Western film, as in Westerns, you know, cowboys, Indians, cattle drives, shootouts, saddles, and spurs. I say meekly because even then, in the early days of the film program at Wesleyan and the vanguard of film studies as a formal academic discipline, Janine had a fearsome reputation. She was an exacting taskmaster who suffered no fools or blowhards. And if you missed the 9 a.m. sharp start of that projector, well, tough on you. She locked the door to the screening room. I began the class thinking it would fulfill a requirement for my American Studies major. Midway through the semester, I knew I was meant for the movies and promptly switched my major to film with Janine's warm support and encouragement. You see, despite her well-deserved reputation as a formidable icon, what I and all her students swiftly came to understand was that her knowledge and love of her subject were genuine, prodigious, and buoyant, and we couldn't help but be carried along. She makes her students her family and makes us feel like we are the most important people in the world, whether we go on to become Hollywood mega moguls like Joss Whedon and Michael Bay, or Philadelphia moms toiling away in obscurity like me. I've had the privilege of calling Janine not only my mentor, but also my friend in all the intervening years. And I'm one of literally hundreds. Among other notable names in her orbit are directors John Turtletow, Miguel Arteta, and Ben Zeitlin, Game of Thrones creator D.B. Weiss, producers Lawrence Mark, Jenno Topping, and writer-director Akiva Goldsman, writer Bruce Eric Kaplan, agency head Rick Nasita, and actors Dana Delaney and Bradley Whitford. Local Philadelphia connections include the Binswanger family, whose eponymous teaching prize has twice been bestowed on Janine. And my friend, classmate, and Friend Central alum, David Kendall, also known as the creator of Boy Meets World and iCarly and other hugely successful television series. Add to that, Janine has built up a world-class cinema archive at Wesleyan where by sheer force of her reputation, personality, and charisma, she has attracted the collections of such film luminaries as Martin Scorsese, Clint Eastwood, Frank Capra, Ingrid Bergman, Ilya Kazan, John Waters, and Raoul Walsh. The list goes on. And somehow, among all this talent nurturing and superlative teaching and traveling around the country to attract support for her ambitious building projects and devoting time to her loving family, Janine somehow manages to write books about film, and not just a few of them. Books on westerns and war films and silent film and the woman's film and the Hollywood star machine, among other things. One of my greatest regrets about coming late to the film major was that I missed out on some of Janine's signature classes. You see, she was pretty much a one-woman operation in those days, teaching a series of different classes in rotation. One that I missed was the Hollywood musical. Now, with the publication of Janine's new book, I can watch all my beloved musicals and imagine I am back in Janine's class. The movie musical is an authoritative and beautifully illustrated guide to the silver screen's most whimsical genre. Here to discuss it with her is film critic and writer Carrie Rickey, who held the post of film critic at the Philadelphia Inquirer for 25 years. It is my great pleasure to welcome Janine Basinger and Carrie Rickey to the Free Library. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to the Philadelphia chapter of the Janine Basinger Appreciation Society. <laughs> and many here can boast that uh, Janine was their professor, but um, they might not fully realize that many more of us who never attended Wesleyan can also say that because everything I know about the combat movie and It's a Wonderful Life and um, women's pictures, 
I know from reading Janine. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. And I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot of it's true. <laughs> no, make it true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's start with that, the opening scene of Meet Me in St. Louis. You make a really interesting observation in your book about one of the problems in making musicals is how to establish its musicality. Talk about that opening scene and what Meet Me in St. Louis does. We can believe in sci-fi. We can believe in zombies. We can believe in a lot of stuff. But when it comes to people in our daily lives, singing and dancing, we got big, big problems. <laughs> and I think it is one of the biggest challenges of the musical film is to open up correctly to set the parameters of a world in which people go about their business and they just sing. I'm not talking about the backstage musical, but the more integrated musical that represents the really great achievements of Hollywood, the original musical, in which people sing and dance as they live. And an audience has to be prepared for that. Any good film sets its parameters and puts you in there and prepares you to live under its rules. Uh, whether they make that clear or not, and the rules may be you're not going to be allowed to know what's going on, but that has to happen. So for a musical, the opening really matters, and Meet Me in St. Louis does a really perfect job of doing that. Are you going to show the clip? They've shown it. They've seen it already. Oh, they saw it. While we were gossiping. Who told me that? Okay. <laughs> How did you like it? <laughs> yes. It's always nice to find out things. Well, here's the thing. The, the movie is about a house. It's about this beautiful house that's their home. Are they gonna lose it or are they gonna keep it? So the movie starts there. It's about a family. The movie starts with the family, the little girl going to the grandpa, going to the girls arriving home. And it's about music being natural to their behavior. And it's about St. Louis. And so all of those things are beautifully set up right away in the most natural and comfortable way that you could possibly have. So that is a great beginning to, uh, to a musical film because it sets the parameters of a musical universe in a natural way, but also introduces you to characters, to the theme, the motif, the whole thing. It just couldn't be better. Agreed. Good. <laughs> um, could you kind of con contrast Meet Me in St. Louis with, you don't have to use this movie, but, you, but any other movie that doesn't quite make it, but let's say Damien Chazelle's La La Land, which likewise begins with a fantastic opening scene, uh, establishing the film's musicality, but doesn't quite carry through in other ways. Well, you just answered your own question. I mean, it, <laughs> it, 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 it does definitely start out beautifully. It's a wonderful musical number, and it clearly says this is a musical universe. These people are frustrated, and they sing and dance their frustration in a typical L.A., uh, you know, car thing. And, um, it, but then it just kind of gets over that nonsense. I mean, after that, the music is linked either to actual performance. He's a jazz musician or to their own characters in isolation from everybody else. So they begin to waffle on what the definition of musicality really is, and they lose it. Sometimes it's a musical universe, sometimes it isn't. And one of the main problems I feel, and if you love La La Land, I love you madly, and I forgive you, <laughs> uh, but it is that these people really can't sing and dance. So, yeah, I mean, I want my money back. <laughs> By the way, I recommend asking for your money back because I frequently do it and I get it back. And like, you know, this is a great savings because there's a lot of bad movies out there, so just remember my tip. But the thing is, they don't come up to the level of what we associate with musical performance and that we need or want, at least that's very much how I felt. 
And uh, a lot of critical response said that the film, whether you liked it or not, and I'm perfectly comfortable with people disagreeing. So after all, I live it, I teach at Wesleyan, um, <laughs> is that it, they said it revolutionized the musical and it really doesn't. It breaks no new ground for mu the musical format. So that's uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, on the other hand, is a film that established very clearly and specifically at its point in history what a good musical needed to do to succeed and to stay within its own definition. And it had songs sung by both non-professionals and beautiful voices. Yeah. And it had songs that let people act their emotions. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of the La La Sand La La Land songs. Well, really no. Well, did first that. of all, they couldn't. I mean, let's say Judy Garland, Emma Stone. You know, I mean, <laughs> you have a little discrepancy there. But Two redheads. <laughs> also, the thing about it is, a gr the great lyricists of Hollywood's golden era are never people. We we forget to talk about them as the great dialogue writers they really are. I mean, they're really writing dialogue because their characters are expressing themselves through song and dance. And for instance, um, you know, Fred Astaire says to Ginger Rogers, um, lovely, lovely, never, never change. Just keep that breathless charm. Won't you please arrange it? Because I love you just the way you look tonight. But he sings it, and it's a great song, but it's dialogue. It's dialogue, and that's what Judy and Garland she's, and is. And she's washing her hair. Exactly. Uh, in exactly. So it's all natural, and we didn't get that in this film either, and, and that, that diminished it for me. Of course, at the time that I saw La La Land, I'm also spending four years re-looking at every single musical movie released in Hollywood. So, you know, I really had a strong context for whether it was working or not for me. I don't think you mentioned Orchestra Wives. I love Orchestra me Wives. Too. First of all, it has one of my favorite songs. I Got a Gal on Kalamazoo. Well, I like that too, but <laughs> I like that movie. I, I like those old black and white movies that have big band swing. But it, you didn't mention it, did you? I didn't see it. No, yeah. I did not, because it doesn't break uh, any ground. Oh, I, look, I see. Look, okay. If I didn't write about your favorite, write me. I'll write you back, seriously, and tell you exactly what I thought. But you know, this book is 650 pages. Yes. Did anyone need more? I don't <laughs> think so. Maybe rip out 10 pages before you read. But the thing is, I went with films that made a difference or set yes. a type or you know, were like that. Because if it, if it was a typical thing that didn't change anything, then I didn't try to discipline myself. <laughs> what does the movie musical give us that no other genre can? Music. Um, you know, what it gives us is the expression of emotion, the definition of character, the specification of action through song and dance, as opposed to other forms more dramatic. Uh, Ruben Mamoulian, who was a really great film director of musicals and also directed Oklahoma and Carousel, I believe Carousel on stage, said, you can actually get as much intense drama and deep feeling out of a musical as you can out of any kitchen sink drama. It just comes in the form of someone singing and dancing. So I like singing and dancing, and I like surrendering. It, it is designed to give people pleasure or experience or story or character or whatever through music and dance, and that's a different format from other genres. Agreed, too. When sound um, movies became feasible in the late 1920s, um, the impulse of many of the early directors was to replicate the Broadway experience, put the camera in maybe the third row center mm -hmm. and look at people singing and dancing on stage. Um, 
and that really just replicated the experience of Broadway reviews and didn't really use the technology that movies mm -hmm. have. Who were the first filmmakers, and you just mentioned Ruben Mullian, who um, tried different strategies, and what were these great early strategies that well, first of all, it was a great idea that if you were living in Podunk, Alaska, that you could go to a Broadway show and sit in the best seat in the house and see it as a movie. I mean, in the beginning, people thought that was plenty, that was enough, that was a lot. I mean, because this was giving people out in the hinterlands the experience that they couldn't have they couldn't go to a broadway show which was not the same as vaudeville which did come out to them but but right away people started experimenting with cinema and what of course a movie camera could do was get out of that seat and take you up on the stage into the middle of the dancers show their feet show their faces up close uh, and go up above and let them s you see the kaleidoscopic form. It gave you also simultaneously a form of kinetic action of the camera of its own. So it transformed the experience of watching a musical. The movie musical is not the Broadway musical. And one is not better than the other. Well, I think movies are better, <laughs> of course. But I mean, they're different experiences. And you, you live with the music and the presentation of the music from a Broadway show which comes out to you. You live more with the intimacy of a character in a, in a movie musical because you come up and they, they sing very closely to you. So there's and a big difference. And you can difference. see the, their mm. vocal cords move when they're singing, yeah. which is very If they are intimate. actually singing. True. <laughs> because they're often dubbed and, of course, with looping, sometimes some of them just mouthed the words and didn't really sing. That's true enough. Did I answer everything? Well, I would like you to talk about Maybe I, you alluded to Busby Berkeley uh, about those abstract mm -hmm. dancers and legs and feet moving, but um, Busby Berkeley created kind of um, geometric dynamism. Yeah, uh, the way he staged his musicals. What did Fred Astaire do that was kind of the well, opposite of that? The four key people of the early development of the musical are the choreographers, Astaire and Berkeley, and the two directors, really, Mamoulian and Lubitsch. But what Astaire did was really claim total integrity for the dance. He made a great comment. He said, either the camera will dance or I will dance. In other words, he wanted the camera to follow him dancing. He wanted to be in the center of the frame, seen from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, so that the dance itself was the element, the, uh, the, the joy of it, not cutting it all apart, which he did not approve of. Astaire was not anti-cinema. He used slow motion, he used traveling mats, he, he danced on the ceiling, he did all kinds of cinematic tricks, but always in the center of the frame, showing the dancer and honoring the dancer and honoring the choreography. So he brought that, as Gene Kelly said, when it comes to dance on film, everything starts with Fred Astaire because Fred Astaire made people respect dance as dance on film. Berkeley was an entirely different kind of person. In fact, he was a loony bun, I can tell you, because I <laughs> interviewed him once and I barely escaped with my life. But that is a different story. Now, he created, he had been in the military and he had learned about formations and blocks and things and he took a mathematical approach of things being multiple, going in formation, in kaleidoscope effect, being seen from above to for make formations. But his important contribution, there just wasn't any place to go with it after a while. He was the opposite. He said, the dancers will be still and the camera will dance and we will see through the eye something that becomes a dance for your eye. He also did have troops of dancers dancing sometimes, but he proved that the movie musical 
is not the Broadway musical. He took you to a place allegedly on stage and you see a number and that all makes sense. Then at a certain point, he enters out to that into a f another space that you could never see on a proscenium arch. And then inside that, he goes like into Ruby Keeler's eyeball or something. And then inside there is just an insane abstraction. So he proves the dance on film is something very different from dance in front of people on a stage. So he's very important to film history for that reason. <coughs> and, um, well, I don't know. We could talk about Lubitsch and Mamoulian all night, but let's not right now. <laughs> um, I love them. Pardon me? I love them. <laughs> me too. I mean, I think uh, Janine and I agree about the, the great early musicals and musicals that really haven't been surpassed were by um, uh, Ernst Lubitsch uh, and Ruben Mamoulian, whose Love Me Tonight may still be the best musical, it's a great musical ever no made. And if you it. haven't seen it, find it somehow. It's really Although charming. it's really hard during the streaming wars to find <laughs> the movies that you need, but it's, it's amazing. Um, what qualities did Broadway stars like Fred Astaire bring to the Hollywood musical that others like Ethel Merman conspicuously lacked? And I, you talked about how Astaire wanted his dances uncut and the whole, bo you know, the whole body in space was what he was about. But why did uh, Fred Astaire work and Ethel Merman not? Well, this is the mystery of stardom, isn't it? And also the mystery of talent and what kind of talent it works well on film. Uh, Astaire was a dancer and she was a singer, so right there you have a difference. But he could be, he, he is about movement and about something that goes around you and takes you forward and backwards and that is that means cinema. It, cutting is a part of dancing, the movement, the rhythm. To stand in one place and sing, even though you can belt it out to the back row, like or pass over across the street into the bar, like Ethel Merman, is a different kind of thing. But it, it's also about another mystery of stardom. We just, some people seem alive in film in a way that others don't. I thought a lot about Ethel Merman. Uh, I had seen her in Gypsy on Broadway, and oh my gosh, she was epic. She was absolutely epic. I mean, it was not only that she could hit the back of the wall with her voice, she just, she filled everything up. I mean, she was fabulous, and on film, she never has that quality. So it's the mystery of the camp. There is something totally unanswerable and inexplicable about an individual on film, how they come across. It's about whether you feel you can believe you understand what they're thinking and feeling. It's, who knows, there, I, I, look, I wrote a whole book on that too. I mean, it's, it's a mystery, but he works on film in some graceful, elegant, moving way. You know, when Astaire walks, he, he walks a, a dance. He swings an arm, he kinda, he kinda grooves along, you know, walking like some great drummers walk, you know, like they're responsible for the rhythm of life and they just can't <laughs> let us down, you know? And he has that quality and she does not have that quality. Her talent was different. It was made for the theater. I think she she fed off the audience, and she can't feed off a camera somehow. Who knows? But um, you uh, pay tribute in your book, as you did earlier tonight, um, to these great lyricists and um, composers who of the popular song, mm -hmm. and who really knew how to write for other voices and um, character, who wrote characters. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that you know, the Hollywood musical is inextricably linked with um, American popular song. 
Um, and I've always wondered to what extent uh, the change in American popular music from the Tin Pan Alley writers who were so good at creating characters like Judy Garland's in Meet Me in St. Mm -hmm. Louis to the singer-songwriters of the 1960s and 70s who wrote for their own voice only and who didn't think in terms of character and drama, who, who could write about their drama. Well, we weren't making musicals in the same way at that time. And when we did, it would, be a, yeah. it would be a documentary, a concert film. And some of the concert films are fantastic and they absorb, they're musical films and they absorb a musical character who comes on stage in a costume and performs and sings about how he or she feels inside. It's similar, it's just not a um, narrative movie of the type we had before. Times change, things seem to go forward differently, but in many ways they're kind of the same. But uh, the, the, um, the vernacular speaking film, dialogue film song that was done for Hollywood, you know, Hollywood had a lot of money, they brought all the great songwriters out there. They had all the great songwriters under contract or writing songs for them. And it's just astonishing how many great songs began in Hollywood films. Um, really wonderful. And they had to learn, however, they were writing for a narrative situation. They were writing for a character and for a star, and a star might have a range of this big, and so they couldn't write a song with a range of this big, and a, so a star sang a certain kind of music and, they, and couldn't sing another kind, so they were really restricted when they were writing for Hollywood movies. I mean, suppose you were under contract at 20th Century Fox and your assignment was to write popular songs for Carmen Miranda. Well, she had a Brazilian rhythm, which is an unusual 5-4 kind of rhythm, and she didn't speak much English. She sort of babbled in Portuguese, and you're, you're writing, this is your assignment. So they had a lot of challenges that they met, and it's completely different from the modern songwriting experience, where they're expressing their own personalities and their own ideas and feelings and not getting an assignment in a narrative film. In, in fact, I think the only, it was really in the 80s and 90s in animated movies, um, Disney animation, where you had songwriters writing for characters. Again. Well, uh, you started that in the cartoons of the early True. sound era and then of course Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and that's a really good musical. It's one of my favorites. It has great songs. And also, I love it when the dwarfs get hot there on the play and the piano and singing and dancing. <laughs> it's just great. You know, you forget that they're dwarfs. You forget <laughs> that it's animated because they seem so lifelike and And they're so individual. Them. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. It's great. Um, like the Marx Brothers. <laughs> Um, you, uh, the mus movie musical, uh, your book, is about the American film musical. Yes. Um, did other national cinemas produce musicals comparable to the great American Not musicals? much, no. Uh, first of all, we're not talking about the Bollywood era. I mean, that's a whole giant 45 volume book <laughs> of itself. I love those, they're wonderful. They're, they are, I agree. The greater, Great Britain made some very good musicals. They, they imitated American musicals. They had stars like Jesse Matthews and- Jack Buchanan. Yeah, and they really, uh, Noel Coward, although he didn't really do many musical movies. But, so, but the, um, here's the thing, uh, uh, America had the money, it had the equipment, it had international talent, and it had a great absence of war on its own territory for a long period of time, which is what allowed American cinema to rise to a very high level in terms of the overall view of film history. All the great talent of Europe, all the Germans, all the French, all the British, 
not too many Italians, but they, the Swedes, they came to America and brought all of their talent and their originality and their points of view into the Hollywood cinema. So people forget that the Hollywood cinema at a certain point was truly an international cinema and had the benefit of all those other wonderful talents helping. And so you don't, musicals are very expensive to make and they required, let's say in the golden era when they were turning them out, they had to have so many people under contract, arrangers, composers, um, all, you know. Just, just Choreographers, uh, costumers. Everything. And what, I, I, there's something I knew and I'm glad you wrote about it. They had costumers who were redoing yes. stars' dresses for different turns right, and right. scenes and close-ups. Yeah. The dresses had to dance right. too. And they, uh, it might bang on her legs wrong, and so they had to wait it for one turn of the camera and take it out, take the beads out and make another dress for another one. So a dancer might wear five different dresses in the same number, and with the cutting, of course, they could do that. They also had script timers who had to figure out how long the dance number was going to take by stepping it out around and timing because they needed a budget control and they needed to know what, the, these, these factories were phenomenal places. And I had the good luck to talk to a lot of people who worked behind the scenes and all those films when I was very young, which was a hundred years ago, and you know it was. Well, there weren't movies a hundred years ago, really. Yeah. Movie musicals. And not musicals, <laughs> no. But I could supply my own. But the thing is that they they really paid so much attention, such detail, and because they had these people under contract they could efficiently and reasonably economically do this job, which after the studios collapsed made it harder and harder to make musicals that could make money. Okay. So you talk about in your book something that's very uh, hard for me to talk about, which is how how the musical can can take you into a fantastic place but be still be in a real place mm -hmm. can you give us an example of what you're talking about i i for, forgot to write that the example down to give you something you concrete. mean like something like an american in paris yeah let's take an american well, in it's paris. set in paris and there's <laughs> a really really real place called paris it's in Illinois. <laughs> no, but, uh, so they start out with, you know, it's footage from Paris and you, you're in Paris and then as soon as you meet people, they are not professional singers and dancers. One character is, but nobody else is. And they sing and dance to express themselves and to, you know, you see that they're in a place that you know is real and but you see that it's been established as a reality that contains musical expression. And as I said about Meet Me in St. Louis, those are the parameters that have to be set down. And of course, American in Paris begins with a sort of pseudo musical number of him waking up and setting up his things. It's a little ballet and also with a voiceover. So someone is talking to you as a person, It coming to the movie right away that's like it's a it's a conspiracy between the two of you now you know this is a movie so you know we can do anything we want to here so it's going to be okay but it's very unnerving if you've been sitting in a movie for 20 25 minutes and all of a sudden somebody starts singing to somebody i love the cheese i mean you can't it's just you that just does not work it does not work and you don't see it in real life, except for my husband. Well, talk about the first time you saw your husband. <laughs> the first time I saw my husband was a beautiful fall day in Middletown, Connecticut. He was coming down Court Street. I was going up Court Street. He had flaming red hair. The sunlight hit his hair, and it was like he was on fire. 
he had weird, uh, a weird outfit, and I saw that his briefcase was tied with string. I should have focused on that more. <laughs> um, but he, he was singing and dancing. He was actually singing and dancing. Passersby were looking terrified and backing up <laughs> against the trees. And as he came down, and I'm like, what? This is like I'm in a movie. He spun across me, you know, in front of me, sailed over a fire plug, and went off down the street. And I said, that's for me. <laughs> it took me six months to find that guy. <laughs> and another six months to marry him. 52 years. <laughs> Okay, now, correct me if I don't get all of this right. Oh, I will. <laughs> I know you will. Uh, my takeaways from this book, which are, is really great, is that the musicals that really sing and dance and are memorable have, A, charismatic stars who do one, and bo one or both and very well, mm -hmm. musics and lyrics that enable the performers to act the feelings of their characters through song and dance, a director who immediately brings the audience into the musical realm and integrates the, um, the musical numbers with the plot uh, through dynamic camera work and editing, which doesn't sound so hard until you remind us how few filmmakers have done it. Yeah. What am I missing? Nothing, you did it beautifully. I'm giving you an A. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe an A plus. Can you enlighten us on, on your opinion of Funny Girl? Uh, yeah, Funny Girl. This is about Funny Girl. Uh, well, you know, I, I was never a huge Barbara Streisand fan, but I was a huge Fanny Bryce fan. I thought Funny Girl was a very good musical, uh, beautifully done with really good music, and I love Omar Sharif. So I'm going through, he's really great. So uh, I'm going through the book, you know, working, and I'm working my way toward Barbara Streisand, and I'm thinking, is this gonna be kind of a chore here, you know? And then really, I have to say, she's an amazing talent, and, um, I liked Funny Girl a million more times better when I saw it. I appreciated it more, really, because I wasn't thinking about Fanny Bryce anymore. I was thinking about Barbara Streisand. And when I looked over her work, I will, would like to put in a plug for her really beautiful film, Yentl, which is so underrated, so underrated, and is a really, really good musical. And a modern musical that solved the, the issues that the musical had during that era very well. She's never been given the credit that she deserved, I think, for that. I don't think Funny Girl is a top, top musical over time, but I think it's a very good one. And she's a major talent. Well, I need to ask you what your favorite musical is, and who do you think, what man and woman do you think have the best singing voices, in your I, opinion? I'm sorry, I heard the first part, but uh, about my favorite musical, and what was the second part? Well, the best, <coughs> the best voice from the best voice. a man or, and a woman. Well, my all-time favorite performer of musicals is Fred Astaire. I mean, absolutely. And so let me say, if you don't like him, kindly keep that to yourselves. <laughs> um, I think the best movie singing voice is probably Judy Garland because she can sing anything and she can make it come to life as part of her character uh, with such effortlessness. She really has a fantastic voice. Um, my favorite musical is uh, a question I really can't answer. I, I, you know, it changes all the time. I have so many I love and I have different categories. I, I have best academic musical, best one I saw as a kid, first one I saw as a kid, best animated. You know, I have the, here's my worst nightmare. 
uh, I'm on my deathbed, and the doctor leans down and says, Janine, what was your favorite me? You know, because I, I <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I really don't know, but I, I have a lot that I really like. And, and some, you, one thing I can say is if someone asks me to show a musical and I don't know the audience in any way and I'm not sure if they like musicals, I would always go with Singing in the Rain because it is the musical for people who hate musicals. <laughs> you know, because it's really funny and entertaining in ways other than musical ways. So that's a, a successful one. But I love Love Me Tonight. Carrie and I share that love. And I have so many. It's transcendent. I have so many, I really do. And I love Fred and Ginger. They're wonderful together, absolutely wonderful. Before the next question, I just want to say the best line in Janine's wonderful book is um, she tries to solve the uh, Fred Astaire or Jean Quelly Kelly question, and she said when she was younger, she simplified it to Fred Astaire is the one you give your soul to, and Gene Kelly is the one you give your body to, which I totally <laughs> disagree with. But ultimately, well. she concludes that Fred Astaire, or, or sorry, Gene Kelly strives for perfection, but Fred Astaire achieves it. It's Which great. is very as elegant as a stair. And and I do like both of them and, and I was lucky to be able to meet both of them and talk to them about musicals, which was really great. A great experience for me. I am not an expert on this genre and I but I do love musicals and I I wonder if you can talk a little more about what's happened to musicals. Can can they come back or are we too jaundiced in our lives anymore to want musicals? And is there a musical that has come out recently that you do like? Uh, well, first of all, it's a question about what happened to the musical. And of course, movies are like mirrors. They, <clears throat> they reflect the times they're in. And in reflecting the times they're in, they give back to the times the way they ought to be. And so as we progressed through the end of the studio system into the Vietnam War and a, a totally different world. The musical had a very difficult time surviving because uh, they se began to seem trivial. However, there is such a thing as the serious musical. There's cabaret, there's A Star is Born. There's, so the musical found its way. There's the concert film, there's the animated film where you know you're not in reality anyway. So it did find ways to solve the problem and people think the musical died, but one of the things I discovered in the book was it didn't really die, it just became less popular, less written about, and less talked about, and people kept trying to make them. So um, I had fun tr telling that story because it was different from the sort of cliches about what happened to the musical, but the musical at a certain point began to kind of commit a form of suicide because it, it had to go so serious to be in step with the times that it got all gloomy and no fun. But you could, you know, I do cover this thoroughly in the book. Um, I very much liked the musical The Great, The Greatest Showman that came out. I, that, you know, the critics killed that off. It was produced by Larry Mark, Wesleyan University. And, yes, yeah, and uh, I, I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be embarrassing. I, I'm gonna have to go, and what am I gonna say to Larry? It's gonna be so terrible. And then I went and it was totally great. It was like stomping good old fashioned musical with, with real musical numbers and the feeling was all in, it was very entertaining. So that's a musical that I liked a lot. Uh, I also am a fan of a weird one uh, called Idlewild, which is an all African American one. Uh, I gave that a good review when it opened. Good yeah. for you, Karen, because you know it's kind of a strange musical and it doesn't totally work, but it had an exploration of you know going back into the 30s and if if you could have had African American performers making a genre musical at that time, this is what you might have had. And I, I like that a lot. 
I liked the latest version of A Star is Born pretty good. I liked, um, I liked Rocket Man okay, and I liked Bohemian Rhapsody okay. I wasn't crazy about them, but I did like them. I liked the music. I liked Freddie Mercury. So there, there's always something, you know, going. Uh, don't don't get too excited for cats. I don't think you're going to be loving that very much. Just giving you a little tip there, but you can always ask for your money back. Um, let's see what else. There's there's been several things I I've I've liked, but you know they're not as many. When I was growing up, it was all musicals, of course. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, what's your take on on musicals that have people? who had uh, absolutely no business singing. I'm thinking of uh, Paint Your well, Wagon, which was I, I painful wish, to watch. Excuse me? Paint Your Wagon, which was very painful to yeah. watch. <laughs> well, you know, that's what, you want to know what happened to the musical? There you have it. Um, <laughs> people who have no business singing, like Lee Marvin, not, Clint is actually not too, I, see, I love Clint, so I can, it, it's, it's not, too bad of a singer, and he's a very, very good musician. At least he understood music, but that, no, that doesn't work. It doesn't work, does it? I mean, the trees didn't listen to him, Janine. Yeah, I mean, really. I mean, well, I, I wish if I'm going to a musical, I would like to have people who sing well and dance well in it. I prefer that we not have people singing who can't sing. I hate to say this, but 44 <laughs> years ago, 44 years ago, uh -oh. my favorite musical was when Janine came to my apartment <laughs> and we had Gershwin on dancing together. And I can tell you, there's never been a better movie star in my life than Janine <laughs> Basinger. So I just want you. Uh, thank you, thank you. This is a fabulous person here that a lot of people from our school who have dreams, dreams because of Janine, and has motivated us and given us something to always want to be and live this romantic world because of this woman. So um, we love you so much you. from all of your favorite fans out here. Well, thank uh, you I'm so not sure much. if I'm about to talk this way in the middle of a musical, but... <laughs> so Renee Zellweger's movie came out, yes. talking about Judy Garland. Yes. Um, and it didn't give a great picture of what the movie studio Right. did to a lot of these actors or actresses as kids growing up. Um, comment of what it was like in the studio system, you know, in the musicals with these actors growing up. Yeah. Well, that was a two-part event for me. I loved the first half. Thank you very, very much. The Judy part is hard. Um, you know, there's a, there's a really good book out called Judy Garland, Art and Anecdote by a man named John Fricke. And... He does not whitewash Judy Garland's life or career in any way, but he, he sort of puts aside the idea of poor Judy. He points out that she did 1,100 performances uh, live before she was even in her teens. She lived 47 years, and she worked 45 of them. And she made 30 features, she made 32 TV shows, she guested on another 30. She did over a thousand performances live at the end. And it's like, she, whatever happened to her, she remained a working professional and could do it. And he said, you might want to think about that. So I'm, I'm just, I read the book with great interest. It's a, it's a beautiful and interesting book. And it has great portraits, candids of her. And you see a woman who's uh, often very happy. And so it's a, it's a thoughtful thing. But the studio system was a tough, tough business. Um, Film is still a tough, tough business. It's not for the weak need, and it's they work long hours. But in the years of the studio system, where Garland was a child and a star, those people worked six days a week. They had only Sunday off. They had to report to work by 6 a.m., 7 a.m. at the latest, women almost always by 6. They had a half an hour for lunch, and they worked up until 9 o'clock at night. So they didn't have vacations. If they were popular, they just kept them working. 
And when the sets were being changed and new sets set up, they went off and did interviews or they posed for portraits or they had wardrobe settings. They worked like dogs. And some of them were not quite up to that and they, they were big stars and the studio didn't let up on them and it was a very destructive thing for them. I did not like the flashbacks of Judy. I thought they, um, I, I, I thought they were heavy-handed in the portrait, you know, of her, uh, of of the way she would have been treated by Louis B. Mayer. Uh, but we're not. It was not a business that cared a whole lot about whether they could take it or not. Uh, they figured they signed up for it. They were being paid a lot of money, and that it's, this, I don't know what to say. I would like to say, oh, they were kind and sweet, and they had tea and cookies, but they didn't. Um, and Judy Garland was not treated well by the studio nor by her family, and she had a rough time of it. She was fragile emotionally, obviously. Did you like the film, Judy? Yeah, I thought I was gonna hate the darn thing, uh, but I thought it was well done, except I did not like those flashbacks. They were heavy handed, but I thought Renee Zellweger was good. I thought she was great. I, I can't believe I'm saying that, but I-, I, I Cause I, you didn't it, like her in Chicago, right? I didn't, no, yeah. I didn't. So uh, I'm glad you liked that. Mine is actually a follow up on that. How did Shirley Temple escape the uh, the movie. Night. Shirley Temple, um, first of all, had a super protective family around her. Uh, she didn't come from poverty the way Judy did. She didn't. She was a volunteer to work. I mean, her mother was a stage mother. They all denied that always, but her mother was a good stage mother. She was protective of her child, and they always kept a cocoon around her. And she left show business to have a normal life in her teenish kind of years. She came back and made a few movies, but she liked doing it, and they made it a happy experience for her. So she didn't have that traumatic sense of, if you fail, you're letting the family down, that Judy Garland was earning the living for her family. Shirley Temple was bringing a higher standard of living to her family. Her father was in ba in banking. They they weren't rich, but they were okay. Judy Garland's family wasn't. So there's a big difference. And Shirley Temple, a woman of real intelligence, um, knew to get away from it. She wanted a normal life, and so she kind of rescued herself for that reason. So I think there's there's a difference. In, it has to do with family. It has to do with the two studios and uh, and the fact that um, Shirley Temple was a phenomenon who was a star at four and five. Judy Garland was out in vaudeville making a living at four and five and didn't become successful till later. So you get that balance. I don't know if this is a very good answer. It's just my speculation. Okay. Thank all of you for coming. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Thank you.